Hello, I'm Valerie Reed, and today I'm going to read three ex excerpts from the book The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid, a memoir written in 2006 by Bill Bryson. Now, Bill Bryson is a uh, one of my favorite authors, and some of his more popular books that you may know are A Walk in the Woods and A Short History of Nearly Everything. A Walk in the Woods became a movie with Robert Redford and Nick Nolte about Bill Bryson's adventures walking the Appalachian Trail. Uh, the excerpts that I'm going to read from The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid are informative and humorous about growing up in the Midwest in the 50s. And two things I'd like to clarify is that in the 50s, most mothers did not work, um, but Bill Bryson's mother did. She and his father were both editors for the local Des Moines newspaper. The other thing is there's a reference to um, an egg timer dinging off. And that is because when we were children, um, our parents believed that if we went in the water not you know earlier than 30 minutes after we had eaten we would succumb to a cramp and die so that's what that's a reference to is waiting for the egg timer to go off so here we go the only downside of my mother's working was that it put a little pressure on her with regard to running the home and particularly with regard to dinner, which frankly was not her strong suit anyway. My mother always ran late and was dangerously forgetful into the bargain. You soon learned to stand aside about 10 to 6 every evening, for it was then that she would fly in the back door, throw something in the oven, and disappear into some other quarter of the house to embark on the thousand other household tasks that greeted her each evening. In consequence, she nearly always forgot about dinner until a point slightly beyond way too late. As a rule, you knew it was time to eat when you could hear baked potatoes exploding in the oven. We didn't call it the kitchen in our house. We called it the Burns unit. It's a bit burned, my mother would say apologetically at every meal, presenting you with a piece of meat that looked like something, a much-loved pet perhaps, salvaged from a tragic house fire. But I think I scraped off most of the burn part, she would add, overlooking that this included every bit of it that had once been flesh. Happily, all this suited my father. His palate only responded to two tastes, burnt and ice cream. So everything suited him so long as it was sufficiently dark and not too startlingly flavorful. Theirs truly was a marriage made in heaven, for no one could burn food like my mother or eat it like my dad. As part of her job, my mother bought stacks of housekeeping magazines. House Beautiful, House and Garden, Better Homes and Gardens, and I read these with a curious avidity, partly because they were always lying around and in our house all idle moments were spent reading something, and partly because they so depicted lives so absorbingly at variance with our own. The housewives in my mother's magazines were so collected, so organized, so calmly on top of things, and their food was perfect. Their lives were perfect. They dressed up to take their food out of the oven. There were no black circles on the ceiling above their stoves, no mutating goo climbing over the sides of their forgotten saucepans. Children didn't have to be ordered to stand back every time they opened their oven doors. And their foods, baked Alaska, lobster Newburgh chicken cacciatore, why, these were dishes we didn't even dream of, much less encounter in Iowa. Like most people in Iowa in the 1950s, we were more cautious eaters in our house. On the rare occasions when we were presented with food with which we were not comfortable or familiar on planes or trains, or when invited to a meal cooked by someone who was not herself from Iowa, 
we tended to tilt it up carefully with a knife and examine it from every angle, as if determining whether it might need to be diffused. Once, on a trip to San Francisco, my father was taken by friends to a Chinese restaurant, and he described it to us afterwards in the somber tones of someone recounting a near-death experience. And they eat with sticks, you know, he added knowledgeably. Goodness, said my mother. I would rather have gas gangrene than go through that again, my father added grimly. In our house, we didn't eat pasta, rice, cream cheese, sour cream, garlic, mayonnaise, onions, corned beef, pastrami, salami, or foreign food of any type except French toast. Bread that wasn't white and at least 65% air. Spices other than salt and pepper and maple syrup. Fish that was any shape other than rectangular and not coated in bright orange breadcrumbs and then only on Fridays and only when my mother remembered it was Friday, which in fact was not often. Seafood of any type, but especially seafood that looked like large insects. Soups not blessed by Campbell's and only a few of those. Anything with dubious regional names like pone or gumbo or foods that had at any time been an esteemed staple of slaves or peasants. All other foods of all types, curries, enchiladas, tofu, bagels, sushi, couscous, yogurt, kale, rocket, any cheese that was not a vivid bright yellow and shiny enough to see your reflection in had either not yet been invented or was yet unknown to us. We really were radiantly unsophisticated. I remember being surprised to learn at quite an advanced age that a shrimp cocktail was not, as I had always imagined, a pre-dinner alcoholic drink with a shrimp in it. All our meals consisted of leftovers. My mother had a seemingly inexhaustible supply of foods that had already been to the table, sometimes many times. Apart from a few perishable dairy products, everything in the refrigerator was older than I was, sometimes by many years. Her oldest food possession of all, it more or less goes without saying, was a fruit cake that was kept in a metal tin and dated from the colonial period. I can only assume that my mother did all of her cooking in the 1940s so that she could spend the rest of her life surprising herself with what she could find undercover at the back of the fridge. I never knew her to reject a food. The rule of thumb seemed to be that if you opened the lid and the stuff inside didn't make you actually recoil and take at least one staggered step backwards, it was deemed okay to eat. Both of my parents had grown up in the Great Depression and neither of them ever threw anything away if they could possibly avoid it. My mother routinely washed and dried paper plates and smoothed out for reuse spare aluminum foil. If you left a pea on your plate, it became part of a future meal. All our sugar came in little packets spirited out of restaurants in deep coat pockets, as did our jams, jellies, crackers, oyster, and saltine, tartar sauces, some of our ketchup and butter, all of our nap and a very occasional ashtray. Anything that came with a restaurant table, really. One of the happiest moments in my parents' life was when maple syrup started to be served in small disposable packets and they could add those to the household hoard. And by the way, Bill Bryson's mother, with all of those eating habits, lived to be 102. And now... The second excerpt is from a day at the lake. Far out in the lake, there was moored a large wooden platform on which stood an improbably high diving board, a kind of wooden Eiffel Tower. It was, I'm sure, the tallest wooden structure in Iowa, if not the Midwest. No human being had ever been known to jump from it. So it was quite a surprise when, as the egg timer dinged our liberation, Mr. Milton jumped up and began doing neck rolls and arm stretches and announced that he intended to have a dive off the high board. 
Word of the insane intention of the man who looked like Goofy was already spreading along the beach when Mr. Milton jogged into the water and swam with even strokes out to the platform. He was just a tiny stick figure when he got there, but even from such a distance, the high board seemed to loom hundreds of feet above him. Indeed, seemed almost to scrape the clouds. It took him at least 20 minutes to make his way up the zigzag of ladders to the top. Once at the summit, he strode up and down the board, which was enormously long. It had to be to extend beyond the edge of the platform far below. Bounced on it experimentally two or three times, then took some deep breaths and finally assumed a position at the fixed end of the board with his arms at his side. It was clear from his posture and poised manner that he was going to go for it. By now, all the people on the beach and in the water, several hundred altogether, had stopped whatever they were doing and were silently watching. Mr. Milton stood for quite a long time. Then, with a nice touch of theatricality, he raised his arms, ran like hell down the longboard. Imagine an Olympic gymnast sprinting at full tilt toward a distant springboard, and you've got something of the spirit of it, took one enormous bounce and launched himself high and outward in a perfect swan dive. It was a beautiful thing to behold, I must say. He fell with a flawless grace for what seemed whole minutes. Such was the beauty of the moment and the breathless silence of the watching multitudes that the only sound to be heard across the lake was the faint whistle of his body tearing through the air toward the water far, far below. It may only be my imagination, but he seemed after a time to start to glow red like an incoming meteor. He was really moving. I don't know what happened. Whether he lost his nerve or realized that he was approaching the water at a murderous velocity or what, but about three quarters of the way down, he seemed to have second thoughts about the whole business and began suddenly to flail like someone entangled in bedding in a bad dream or whose chute hasn't opened. When he was perhaps 30 feet above the water, he gave up on flailing and tried a new tack. He spread his arms and legs wide in the shape of an X, evidently hoping that exposing a maximum amount of surface area would somehow slow his fall. It didn't. He hit the water, impacted really is the word for it, at over 600 miles an hour with a report so loud that it made birds fly out of trees for up to three miles away. At such a speed, water effectively becomes a solid. I don't believe Mr. Milton penetrated it at all, but just bounced off it about 15 feet, limbs suddenly very loose, and then lay on top of it, still like an autumn leaf spinning gently. He was towed to shore by two passing fishermen in a rowboat and carried to a grassy area by half a dozen onlookers who carefully set him down on an old blanket. There he spent the rest of the afternoon on his back, arms and legs bent slightly and elevated, every bit of frontal surface area from his thinning hairline to his toenails had a raw abraded look as if he had suffered some unimaginable misfortune involving an industrial sander. Occasionally he accepted small sips of water, but otherwise was too traumatized to speak. It was the best day of my life. And finally, this is about his father. In the late 1950s, the Royal Canadian Air Force produced a booklet on isometrics, a form of exercise that enjoyed a short but devoted vogue with my father. The idea of isometrics was that you used any unyielding object like a tree or a wall and pressed against it with all your might from various positions to tone and strengthen different groups of muscles. Since everybody already has access to trees and walls, you ne didn't need to invest in a lot of 
costly equipment, which I expect was what attracted my dad. What made it unfortunate in my dad's case is that he would do his isometrics on airplanes. At some point in every flight, he would stroll back to the galley area or the space by the emergency exit, and taking up the posture of someone trying to budge a very heavy piece of machinery, he would begin to push with his back or shoulder against the outer wall of the plane, pausing occasionally to take deep breaths before returning with quiet grunts to the task. Since it looked uncannily, if unfathomably, as if he were trying to force a hole in the side of the plane, this naturally drew attention. Businessmen in nearby seats would stare over the tops of their glasses. A stewardess would pop her head out of the galley and likewise stare, but with a certain hard caution, as if remembering some aspect of her training that she had not previously been called upon to implement. Seeing that he had observers, my father would straighten up and smile genially and begin to outline the engaging principles behind isometrics. Then he would give a demonstration to an audience that swiftly consisted of no one. He seemed curiously incapable of feeling embarrassment in such situations, but that was all right because I felt enough for both of us. Indeed, enough for us and all the other passengers, the airline and its employees, and the whole of whatever state we were flying over. Two things made these undertakings tolerable. The first was that back on solid ground, my dad wasn't half as foolish most of the time. The second was that the purpose of these trips was always to go to a major league city, stay in a big downtown hotel, and attend ball games. And that excused a great deal. Well, everything, in fact. My dad was a sports writer for the Des Moines Register, which in those days was one of the country's best papers, and often took me along on trips through the Midwest. Sometimes these were car trips to places like Sioux City or Burlington, but at least once a summer, we boarded a big silver plane, a huge event in those days, and lumbered through the summery skies up among the fleecy clouds to St. Louis or Chicago or Detroit to take in a home stand. It was a kind of working holiday for my dad. Baseball, like everything else, was part of a simpler world in those days, and I was allowed to go with him into the clubhouse and dugout and onto the field before games. I have had my hair tousled by Stan Musial. I have handed Willie Mays a ball that had skittered past him as he played catch. I have lent my binoculars to Harvey Kuhn so that he could scope some busty blonde in the upper deck. Once, on a hot July afternoon, I sat in a nearly airless clubhouse under the left field grandstand at Wrigley Field beside Ernie Banks, the Cubs' great shortstop, as he autographed boxes of new white baseballs, which are, incidentally, one of the most pleasurably aromatic things on earth and worth spending time around anyway. Unbidden, I took it upon myself to sit beside him and pass him each new ball. This slowed the process considerably, but he gave a little smile each time and said, thank you, as if I had done him quite a favor. He was the nicest human being I have ever met. It was like being friends with God. I can't imagine there has ever been a more gratifying time or place to be alive than America in the 1950s. No country has ever known such prosperity. When the war ended in the United States, when the war ended, the United States had $26 billion worth of factories that hadn't existed before the war, $140 billion in savings and war bonds just waiting to be spent, no bomb damage, and practically no competition. All that American companies had to do was stop making tanks and battleships and start making Buicks and Frigidaires, and boy, did they. By 1951, when I came sliding down the chute, almost 90% of American families had refrigerators and nearly three quarters had washing machines, telephones, vacuum cleaners, and gas or electric stoves, things that most of the rest of the world could still only fantasize about. Americans owned 80% of the world's electric goods, controlled two thirds of the world's productive capacity, 
produced more than 40% of its electricity, 60% of its oil, and 66% of its steel. The 5% of people on earth who were Americans had more wealth than the other 95% combined. Remarkably, almost all this wealth was American-made. Of the 7.5 million new cars sold in America in 1954, for instance, 99.93% were made in America by Americans. We became the richest country in the world without needing the rest of the world. No wonder people were happy. Suddenly, they were able to have things they had never dreamed of having, and they couldn't believe their luck. There was, too, a wonderful simplicity of desire. It was the last time that people would be thrilled to own a toaster or waffle iron. If you bought a major appliance, you invited the neighbors around to have a look at it. When I was about four, my parents bought an Amana store more refrigerator, and for at least six months, it was like an honored guest in our kitchen. I'm sure they'd have drawn it up to the table at dinner if it hadn't have been so heavy. When visitors dropped by unexpectedly, my father would say, Oh, uh, Mary, is there any iced tea in the Amana? Then to the guests, he'd add significantly, <laughs> There usually is. It's a store more. Oh, a store more, the male visitor would say and elevate his eyebrows in the manner of someone who appreciates quality cooling. We thought about getting a store more ourselves, but in the end, we went for a Philco sure cool. Alice loved the easy glide vegetable drawer, and you can get a full quart of ice cream in the freezer box. That was a big selling point for Wendell Jr., as you can imagine. They'd all have a good laugh at that, and then sit around drinking iced tea and talking appliances for an hour or so. No human beings have ever been quite this happy before. The end.